Hi, and welcome to the opening plenary of the 70th International Communication Association Conference, ICA 2020, not at the Gold Coast of Australia, but in the virtual environment. This year's conference theme is open communication, and I'm delighted that we have also devoted the opening plenary to the topic of open communication and open scholarship. We will first invite our keynote speaker for the conference, Professor Fiona Fiddler, to the podium. Uh, she will give a introduction keynote uh, to the topic. She is from the University of Melbourne. And afterwards, four distinguished members of our ICA community representing different uh, regions and different epistemologies and different divisions of ICA will come on the stage and we will talk a little bit about open uh, science, open communication, open scholarship, and what it might mean for an association and a field like ours. I'm delighted that on that panel we will have uh, distinguished colleagues including Bobby Salazar from um, the Annenberg School at, uh, in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, we'll have Mike Wagner from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. We'll have Neil Lewis from Cornell University. And then we will have uh, Eike Rinke uh, from Leeds University who is also this year's theme chair and who has put together a fantastic program around open communication. So this is also an encouragement to surf around in the virtual environment and see much more about open communication. But first I'd like to invite Fiona to give her keynote address. Welcome to ICA 2020. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to this conference and despite being in dreary, rainy Melbourne with noisy children um, right outside my door, I'm, I'm still absolutely delighted to be part of this conference with the overarching theme that it has and the interesting and thoughtful questions driving that theme. So today I'd like to talk about some open science or open scholarship practices and um, the purpose behind those practices, why, why we should engage in them. I did try to come up with a snappy title that would encompass those ideas, but as you can see, I've completely failed on that front. I hope at least it's accurately descriptive. So here's a quick outline. I'll start with a brief background. By no means, well, it won't cover everything. Um, I guess that's probably a relief. I wanna talk a bit about where we are now. So what the existing initiatives to improve methods and statistical reporting are, things like registered reports and open science badges. And then I wanna talk about what happens after we improve transparency. What are the next steps? And to give away the um, punchline here, I guess, I'm gonna argue that transparency is all well and good, but that there's a lot more to being open. Transparency is the start, not the end of this journey. I'll talk a little bit about what we can learn from other disciplines and uh, also what the limits of that might be. So when in fact we might get into trouble if we over apply tools or guidelines or checklists that have been developed in other fields and if we try and implement them in um, cultures of practice for which they are not a good fit. And I know this organisation encompasses practices from a wide range of scholarly traditions and so this seemed to me a, an important discussion point. And then finally I'll um, complement the excellent questions driving your conference theme again. So first, I should say the background that I'm going to talk about today kind of, it starts really in this circle, this credibility revolution circle. There are overlapping movements here, statistical reforms starting in the 1940s and 50s, the open access movement gaining momentum through the 1990s. But um, in the interest of time, I'll start our story in about 2011. And I want to start actually with those big replication projects. Uh, despite what we may, despite what are, your opinion of them, what you may think of them, they loom very large in this history. So here are a couple of the early and probably still the two most famous of these large scale replication projects. One in psychology by the Open Science Collaboration and one in preclinical medicine by Glenn Beagley. Uh, 
you can see on the y-axis here, this is counting the percentage of successful replications. Now, there's a lot to unpack in that term, obviously, and I hope that that comes up in discussion. There are lots of different ways this can be measured. The most common measure and the one that I'll be referring to when I talk about numbers like 36% or 11% is a match in statistical significance. So if the original study is statistically significant and the replication study is too, then that's considered a success. Failures are usually cases where the original study was statistically significant and the replication study was not. So this one in psychology was, as I said, done by the Open Science Collaboration. This involved 270 researchers across 64 institutions in 11 different countries. And together, they replicated 100 published studies. So studies that have been published in three leading psychology journals all published in the year 2008. And the, replica, the replication success rate in this case was 36%. A similar study in um, preclinical medicine. This actually, this attention to this study was first drawn by Johnny Anides in this paper, this now very famous paper, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False, quite an inflammatory title. And in that paper, he tells the story of Glenn Beagley, who was a chief scientist at a biotech company called Amgen. Beagley's own paper about the episode came out slightly later, well, considerably later, actually. So what Beagley did was commission 100 scientists at Amgen to replicate what were considered to be 53 landmark clinical trials, um, preclinical trials in cancer biology research. So these are preclinical pre trials, not trials with whom human subjects, but trials that if they are successful, then that drug would be pushed into drug development by pharmaceutical companies. And out of those 53 landmark trials, only six could be successfully replicated. So that's a replication success rate of 11%. Um, since then, there have been a bunch more of these kinds of large-scale replication projects across a range of disciplines. And you can see in most cases, they fail to get past even a 50% success rate. There are a few exceptions. One is this one in economics. It's um, mostly lab-based behavioral economics studies, things like game theories that have very tightly controlled experimental conditions. This one is broadly social science studies, including psychology, economics, marketing, and a few other things, but published in the journals Science and Nature. So again, you might expect, you well, you might expect um, higher replication success rate here. Then there's this mysterious discipline, in the, is this yellow bar here, and this is usually a point in the talk where I would ask the audience to guess what field they think this has this replication success rate of 70%. And obviously I can't do that in this talk, but I can tell you that most often someone from the audience will yell out, physics, it's physics. Um, I can tell you that it is not physics, it's experimental philosophy. So, you know, there's something we can talk about as well. So I guess what one question you might ask here is, what, do, what should we expect the replication success rate to be? If we're upset that it's 36%, for example, what would we want it to be? Surely we don't expect it to be 100%. We know that it's not equivalent to the alpha threshold either. We don't expect it to be 95%. Do we expect it to be 83%, the equivalent of a prediction interval, for example? Um, there, there are clearly no easy answers to those questions. But I think that even without answers to those questions, we can be disappointed by rates like 11%, 36%, really even still 60% in studies that offer those very tight experimental controlled conditions. Okay. Now, what I've done here, actually, I didn't do this, I've stolen this from Samin Vizia, but what we can, what one can do here is average across these replication studies, ones that fall in the category of social science. And um, in so much as you might consider your own discipline of communications research to fit in this broad category of social science, then this, this average might be of interest. 
So if we average across social science studies, including some in the graph and others that have occurred since, we get a replicability success rate of 46% and a false discovery rate of one minus that or 54%. Now, there are a lot of assumptions entailed in interpreting this as a false discovery rate. Of course, it assumes that the replication study is always the one that's correct and that the original is always wrong. And of course, that's there's controversy, unsurprisingly, that's controversial. However, there are a couple of reasons that we might have faith in an interpretation like this. One is that, um, that in almost every single one of these cases, the replication studies have much higher statistical power than the original studies, often up to five times the sample size of the original study. And the other is that the second reason is that the replication studies are not subject to publication bias in the way that the original ones were. So publication bias being a bias towards selecting studies based on the statistical significance of their results. So whilst there's a lot of controversy here, there are a couple of reasons. So speaking of publication bias, here is a figure um, based on data from Daniel Finelli created by Ed Young that shows a whole range of different disciplines up the y-axis and along the x-axis, the proportion of papers supporting the hypothesis tested. So the proportion of papers reporting statistically significant results. And as you can see in many disciplines, this is very high in psychology and psychiatry, for example, it's over 90%. So um, why am I connecting this with publication bias? That is what I'm doing. And, um, and I think the evidence for publication bias comes from this. So for some of these disciplines, at least, researchers have gone back through the literature, um, extremely tedious and laborious work and done back calculations of the average statistical power for those fields. So in psychology, this work was first done by Jacob Cullen, but there have been many other studies since then calculating the average statistical power of psychological research for different effect sizes, for example, small, medium or large effect sizes. Uh, these three disciplines I've displayed here are the ones for which I could find this kind of study of average statistical power. Okay, so if we take the case of psychology, the percentage of statistically significant results in the published literature is 92%. Yet we know the average statistical power for effect sizes that are typical um, of typical size in psychology, medium size, uh, is around 50%. In fact, it may even be lower than that. If there was a world in which publication bias didn't exist, if articles were not being selected on the basis of whether they had statistically significant results or not, but instead, I don't know, being selected for on the basis of things like, do they ask an interesting question or are the methods well designed, are the analysis appropriate to the design and methods, rather than just judged on the basis of whether the outcomes reach a statistical significance threshold. Well, in that kind of world, we would expect the proportion of published statistically significant results to be roughly equal to the average statistical power of the field. But you can see that in um, all of these disciplines, there's a, a rather large discrepancy between those two figures, an excess of statistical significance. We can also see other data from Daniel Finelli tells us that publication bias is becoming worse over time. So um, this is uh, perhaps particularly true in the social sciences and the timeline across which we see this increase in publication bias appears to be consistent with a rise of something we will all um, find familiar, I'm sure, a publish or perish research culture. Whereas once upon a time when we talked about publication bias, we used to talk about the file draw problem. So if a study didn't work or turned out to be negative, have non-significant results, researchers would put it down in the bottom drawer of their filing cabinet and it would never be sent away for publication. What, um, what is likely under the conditions of a publish or perish culture is that those 
failed studies will be resuscitated back to statistical significance um, and then into the published literature through a range of, well, not, not quite fraudulent, not quite fraud or scientific misconduct, that would be too strong, but a range of what we might call questionable research practices, in particular questionable statistical practices. These will no doubt be familiar to many of you, um, these terms, pea hacking and cherry picking, things like violating stopping rules by checking whether the results are p less than 0.05 and if they're not running another 10 subjects or another taking another 20 surveys, etc., or deciding to exclude data points, not for principled reasons, but just to get under that statistical significance threshold, or cherry picking, failing to report the outcome variables or relationships that failed to reach the magical 0.05 level, and then just leaving them out of the write-up altogether. And all of these practices lead to inflated false positive error rates. They mean our alpha rate is no longer 0.05, but depending on how many of these or how frequently we engage in these, the alpha rate may blow out to close to 50%. Harking is another one, hypothesizing after the results are known. Now this is sometimes controversial, sometimes people take this as a, a slight against exploratory research, for example, um, and, and it's not meant to be that. It's rather a statement against just looking, um, mining for a whole bunch of correlations, for example, and then retrospectively fitting hypotheses to those and presenting the work as though it was a confirmatory hypothesis testing study from the beginning. Okay, now you might think these are terrible. Surely these happen rarely. Who would do such a thing? Well, survey after survey of researchers across a range of disciplines have reported consistently high, self-reported consistently high levels of engaging in these practices. For example, the, the cherry picking idea of not reporting the outcome variables that are not statistically significant. We find that in many disciplines, those rates are nearly two thirds of researchers will admit to engaging in that, excluding data points, not again, not for principled reasons, but just to get under that statistically significant threshold is a, often a quarter or a third or more of researchers will um, admit to having engaged in such practices. Okay. This slide shows an idealized hypothetical deductive scientific method. Now I'm going to ask you to accept this uncritically for a moment, though I know for many of you that will probably be difficult. It's difficult for me too. But um, let's assume that these blue arrows here represent an ideal hypothetical deductive cycle. And what we see in red text are all of the places where this method is currently disrupted by what I at least consider to be uncontroversial problems. Now, there are other problems we might disagree about that are controversial. Um, we might even disagree about the value of this hypothetical deductive method to begin with. But if we are doing research that does legitimately fit in a hypothetical deductive space, and we are engaging in these activities in red text, well, then we are in trouble. going to take a quick look now at, at where we are now. So um, in recent years, there have been a lot of coordinated journal interventions. For example, open science badges, um, the transparency and openness promotion top guidelines. These in particular have thousands of journals and institutions as signatories to these guidelines. New reporting checklists in a range of disciplines, including in nature now and registered reports. Registered reports are um, an intervention that changes the point of peer review in the publication proce process. So um, uh, also will submit for publication uh, the introduction methods and planned analysis of a study before data collection has occurred. It will go out to review in that 
in that form and the journal will make an in principle decision to accept or reject based on things like how interesting the question is, how well designed the methods are, how appropriate the statistical analysis is to that method and design. So all the things that we want research to be judged for rather than just rather than the thing, sorry, all of the things that we want research to be um, judged on and all of the things that researchers themselves have control over, rather than the one thing that researchers have no control over and we, that we don't want them to have control over, which is how the results turn out on the day. Um, in addition, we have a lot of new communities, either official formal societies or informal networks that have been developed over the last few years that bring people together to talk about these issues and um, create space for collaborations. We also have lots of new technology to facilitate openness. Um, here's a slide obviously stolen from the open science framework, but um, I use it to show that there are a lot of developments in this field. So once we've increased transparency through those wonderful initiatives, then what happens? Well, as Samin Vizier um, eloquently said, transparency alone doesn't guarantee credibility. It only guarantees you the credibility you deserve. Oh, I apologize for the typo in that slide. She said it much better than that. Um, now, one question that often follows this is something like, but science is self-correcting, right? I think it's important that we disabuse ourselves of, ourselves of the idea that there is some kind of magical, monolithic scientific method that has an inbuilt self-correction mechanism. There is no monolithic scientific method. Self-correction happens because people do it because they engage in critical appraisal or error detection or replication work. And for those things to happen, to, for people to do that work, we need a culture, a research culture that invites it, that doesn't resist it. So we need to prize that error detection work, not treat it with suspicion. And we need to reward, we need to fund and publish replication studies, um, not disregard them because they're not novel and groundbreaking and not consider them to be stepping on other people's toes or evidence of some kind of personal vendetta. In short, we need to be more open to criticism. Here are some signs that now I actually I should say I hope that um, your own field of communications research is in a much better place um, than this. But here are, so, here are some signs that we've seen in psychology at least, signs that the research culture just isn't quite there yet. These are um, names that various researchers who engage in error detection and replication, names they've been called or charges that have been made against them. They've been told they're on a, it, that it's a witch hunt um, they've been called the self-appointed data police, second stringers. That one's targeted at people who do replication studies. The idea is that those people lack the creativity or original thought to design their own studies. Data thugs is a label that's often um, thrown at people who engage in error detection research. Um, I'll skip the, a couple there at the end. <laughs> Um, so signs that the science, signs that the culture is not open yet. James Heathers has argued in this blog, Hugs, Shrugs and Data Thugs, that um, a good place to start would be giving this work a name. He says there's no in case term for a scientific critic or the, a name for the role of a person who investigates published science for demonstrable inaccuracy. So this, um, this might be the role for meta science or meta research that it can provide a home and a name for that error detection work. 
that um, it can evaluate the kind of interventions that we make when we develop new open science initiatives, that it can evaluate things like whether open science, um, sorry, whether open data badges are efficiently doing the job we want them to do or whether pre-registration has led to the outcomes that we wanted. Meta research work can also monitor for perverse incentives or gaming of those initiatives. It can, look, it can advocate for structural change in institutions and encourage interdisciplinary exchanges as well. Okay, let's talk about lessons from other disciplines. Here's a tweet from Daniel Larkins, and he's commenting here on some economists who have who are getting interested in pre-registration. Says you'd think the economists would value would value the efficiency of not having to reinvent the wheel for the next five years. He said he's made this comment because of an article that is devoid of any references to medicine that has had registered trials for decades or psychology which has had pre-registration for um, six years. So um, the, this seems perhaps, perhaps reasonable. There are lessons that we can learn from other disciplines. There are um, templates that have been developed for pre-registration, a lot of debate and discussion about the role of pre-registration in those disciplines, and there are definitely lessons that new fields contemplating using pre-registration could learn from those histories. But there's also a tension here, isn't there? Because what if pre-registration isn't applicable to your research? Uh, what if you do quali exploratory qualitative research or exploratory modelling research? And then what if pre-registration becomes synonymous with good quality? What if journals adopt pre-registration as a, a blanket policy and then genuinely exploratory work gets rejected because of this? So these are all reasonable and fair concerns, I think. And I, I think we need to think harder about how to not sideline those fields outside of that hypothetical deductive framework I mentioned earlier. That's the framework where pre-registration should live. We need to work out, uh, we need to not sideline fields outside of that framework, but we also need to work out how to critically evaluate that work as well. What equivalent standards should it be held to? Okay, this is a paper by Sabina Leonelli, uh, who is a philosopher of science. Here she's concerned with reproducibility as a metric for quality. So I'm moving on now from pre-registration as a metric for quality and to talk about reproducibility becoming a metric for research quality. And this, in this paper, Leonelli talks about when this metric is appropriate and when it isn't appropriate, rather in what fields it might be appropriate and, and in what fields it might not be appropriate. And in Leonelli's account, this is partly about interdisciplinary differences, about over applying standards from one discipline to another, or rather from one set of epistemic practices, like randomized control trials in medicine, for example, to uh, another set of practices. And she argues, that the extent to which one can apply um, tools, checklists and so on that have been developed in different fields, to the extent that one can apply those to new contexts depends not only on the discipline, but also in the match in the, the methods or the approach being taken. So taking, for example, randomised control checklists from medicine to experimental psychology might be fine, but taking those randomised control checklists from medicine um, into, uh, sorry, from if, taking those randomised control checklists from experimental psychology then into observational research or case study work in any field might not be okay. Um, and I would argue that the extent, I would add to that, that, the extent that we can borrow such tools depends not only on a match in the methods that we're using or the approach we're taking, but also on a match in research purpose. So for example, the extent to which we anticipate our research findings to uh, will underpin action or decision or policy 
Here, are the, here is the excellent list of questions from your conference website. They certainly are questions for our time. And I would um, encourage you when you're thinking about what good open science practices are and how they can be applied in your discipline to um, consider that tension between learning from other disciplines and, um, and over applying criteria that aren't appropriate to the purpose of your own research context. I would also um, stress the importance of evaluating and monitoring whatever interventions you do adopt with meta-scientific or meta-research work or reaching out to the meta-research community and getting them to evaluate your interventions. I think thinking about how to be respectful of different epistemological communities is really important as well. And in the Leonelli article I mentioned before, she emphasizes, for example, what quantitative researchers might learn from qualitative researchers in terms of things like disclosure statements or statements of position, positionality and transparency. And finally, in this final question, um, what are the roles and responsibilities of different actors? I think that we re it's really important to think about the right targets for action and advocacy. We've seen a lot of, um, a lot of work so far or a lot of criticism so far targeted at individual researchers and also at journals and the publication process at how the way funding is um, delivered. But I think the neglected part of the puzzle at the moment is institutions, what the roles and responsibilities of our universities should be. Right, um, that is the end of my talk. I will just shamelessly plug here at the end my lovely research group here in Melbourne and a project that we are working on at the moment, the Replicats Project, Collaborative Assessments for Trustworthy Science. There's more information on our website if anyone's interested. And again, thank you very much for letting me be part of this conference. So thank you, Fiona. Thank you very much for this inspiring and I think also very encompassing uh, opening keynote to our conference and also very nice introduction to the theme of the conference. Uh, I'm delighted that we have such a great uh, panel uh, on, on stage uh, uh, to discuss the topic of open communication and open scholarship. Um, and what we'll do is that we will first invite all of our participants in this panel to give a few reflections uh, on the theme and on your uh, opening keynote and then we'll have discussion amongst us uh, and then very importantly for the ones watching this recording then there will be the opportunity to ask questions and to comment in the chat room where all of us will also be checking out during the conference days but first of all and again thanks a lot for this introduction we have uh, four members on the on the panel that are also uh, representing different divisions uh, in the ICA um, and we have decided to go in an order where uh, Professor Mike Wagner from the University of Wisconsin at Madison will go first, then we will go to Eike Rinke, who is at Leeds University and who, very importantly, is also this year's theme chair and has put together a fabulous program around open communication. So this is just one little element of it, but please check out this entire uh, conference free programming throughout the conference. Uh, then we'll jump to uh, Neil, Lew uh, Neil Lew Lewis at the Cornell University. Uh, and finally, we will have Barbie Seliser from the Annenberg School and the director of the Media at Risk Center uh, at the University of uh, Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. But without much further ado, I'm first going to introduce uh, Mike Wagner and ask him to offer the first reflections. Mike. Thank you very much, Clace. And uh, I want to thank Fiona for an informative and generative talk. Uh, I especially appreciated the focus on transparency from the start, uh, the, the excellent uh, interrogation um, of uh, you know how we interpret one failed replication as compared to one statistically significant finding that's been published on the same thing, the the reminder uh, that scholars must be open to criticism uh, and engaged reflection upon their work, and the reminder that the the models discussed in the bulk of the the presentation might not apply to all kinds uh, of inquiry. Um, I want to spend my my time. Uh, thinking about expanding the boundaries of how we think about open science replication and transparency in a couple of ways. What I, I think is the most important claim I have for us to think about is this. 
when we think about useful models for open scholarship, it's clear from Fiona's excellent presentation that we must consider the discipline, the methods, and what the scholars in question are trying to learn. I also suggest it's important for us to think about how well-resourced scholars at various institutions are, uh, as well as the natures of the populations they wish to study. And after discussing that for a minute, uh, I'll, I'll close with some thoughts on, on open science and, and qualitative research. Um, so first, you know, discussions of open science usually involve conversations about replication and pre-registration. And replications, as Fiona noted, often have much more statistical power than study they seek to replicate. And that, that seems like an obvious good. Uh, however, it, it has the potential, I think, to privilege well-resourced scholars in at least two ways. First, it might mean that the less well-resourced scholars are more likely targets for replication because of the size of the samples they study and quantitative work. And secondly, it likely means that less well-resourced scholars are less able to participate in replication studies that have uh, more power. So pre-registration, I think, also is a greater burden, perhaps, on less well-resourced scholars, unless that pre-registration comes with a pre-acceptance from journals. Uh, open science isn't likely to alter incentives related to publishing in terms of quantity and hitting journals with high impact factors. And so those who can afford to run 20 to 30 experiments or, or two, three, four, five national surveys a year can afford to pre-register and have initial hypotheses fail to pan out, while those who are running the one study they can afford might find themselves in a different position. And if replication and pre-registration's already considerable cachet continues to increase, open science might inadvertently help the rich get richer. Uh, as a more general side note to this point, uh, when replications are engaged in, I, I wanted to make sure I say that I think we need to be as open uh, to criticism as scholars facing scrutiny to our work. The replicators also ought to consider engaging the authors of the studies facing replication. There, there are good models of this uh, in political science and in political communication uh, specifically, I think for us to consider emulating, and I'm happy to discuss that um, as, we, as we go on. Um, second, research upon vulnerable populations creates what I think is an important tension for open science. On the one hand, we might especially want results from these studies to hold up to scrutiny. Uh, on the other hand, we also might wish to be especially mindful of the toll that research can take upon vulnerable populations, as well as scholars doing that research. And I, I don't have an answer for this either, but I think it's something that would benefit from greater deliberation, um, perhaps in our group, but, but more generally in the scholarly community. Um, and then finally, a, a word about qualitative research. While most of the work I do involves surveys and experiments and content analyses, the, the more work I do involving elite interviews, focus groups, and the like have helped me to grow more attuned to thinking about how qualitative data can be shared in transparent ways that don't violate the rights of the participants. Uh, qualitative data and qualitative data analysis isn't magic, and sometimes quantitative scholars treat it as such, and it, it is not. It should invite as much scrutiny as any quantitative research, but questions surrounding how different qualitative analytic strategies uncover themes, for example, are, are distinct areas to engage uh, as compared to pure replications of survey questions and experimental treatments on a population in study one by the original scholars and study two from uh, replicating scholars. Uh, our own group um, at the uh, Center for Communication and Civic Renewal at UW-Madison that I direct posts the data we use in our published work online. We leave detailed online appendices for other scholars to interrogate, learn from, question, and build upon. And, and we're just honestly less far along in how we share the qualitative elements of, of the work um, that we do. And so I'm, I'm hoping to benefit from, from all of your uh, wisdom in, in our discussion today as well. Um, I also, uh, last thing I'll say is I, I love the idea uh, in Fiona's talk uh, that we need a name beyond critic uh, for the work uh, she was discussing. Um, I don't have a great answer, but my opening salvo is, uh, is a forensic accountant of replication uh, or FAR scholar. So thanks for having me on the panel and uh, I look forward to uh, the discussion. I think, uh, you know, as far as introductory remarks going, nailing a new, uh, a new title for the type of scholars, as well as also acknowledging that in this panel, we won't be coming up with all the answers to these, uh, these big questions. This is also a, uh, a panel that is supposed to get a conversation going and to set an agenda that will be wide spanning across the association. So thank you, Mike, and uh, then we'll uh, continue with ICAP.
Thank you, Claes, uh, for the introduction. Uh, thank you for having me uh, on this panel. I'm uh, really glad to be having this conversation with you. Uh, well, first of all, I, I'd like to also, of course, uh, thank Fiona for uh, her excellent keynote. I love watching it, especially since it, I think, covered so much ground so elegantly uh, when it comes to addressing open, open scholarship in all its breadth. Really. It's it's really broad uh, movement at this point, and uh, I think uh, it brought home the gist of it uh, ele very elegantly. So my point uh, in these short remarks mostly is uh, is simple, and this is uh, mostly that on the one hand, I think uh, open scholarship re requires of us uh, as uh, those who want to engage in it um, some measure of unlearning things. But also, uh, I would like to add that it also requires, uh, importantly, and that's often, I think, overlooked, uh, some measure of relearning of our own principles. Right? So first, there's the unlearning, uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, and I think uh, the unlearning part mostly, at least in the kind of research uh, that I engage in, usually quantitative, uh, really oriented, uh, po uh, positivist uh, research, if you like, it is an unlearning of, uh, of uh, a sort of, uh, valuing mostly though uh, this kind of uh, the kind of research that produce produces beautiful stories i would say uh, so uh, the new thing here uh, that i think we need to learn as researchers is that we will need to accept uh, as open scholars that our studies in, uh, that are open if they are openly conducted will be less flashy less novel maybe of, of lower news value uh, in a general sense uh, in the future than they used to be uh, or than we used to aspire to and but in, on on the other hand, they will be more often true, hopefully, and more credible, uh, and, and indeed also more credible in the in the public eye and in public perception as well. And so the mark of the quality of an empirical study, according to open scholarship, I think, uh, and this is an important point to make, is, is not the substance of its findings, but uh, at least uh, not uh, if considered independently, but but rather the mark uh, of the quality of empirical work uh, from an open scholarship point of view will be. Uh, the the quality of its theory and methods, and that's uh, of course not new thing, entirely new thing to to appreciate, but it's uh, maybe uh, a strengthened focus, I would say, uh, that uh, that open scholarship impresses on us. So notably, uh, I think openness is a requirement for neither of these things, um, and in fact, it's of course possible to conduct an insightful and even path-breaking study that's completely closed and kept fully private. Um, but uh, openness, uh, I think, uh, makes us all the more confident uh, in yeah, in our uh, in the degree to which uh, path breakingness or insight was actually achieved in a, in a study. So, but this is the unlearning part. But I think uh, what's important also is uh, is uh, the aspect of relearning things. Openness, open scholarship, as as a movement towards relearning uh, something about our own principal commitments. I think. So while uh, while novelty and flashiness, I think, uh, of our research will go down if we if we are serious about open scholarship, on the upside, openness makes uh, uh, should make us much more confident in our ability to be trustworthy and credible. Like I already said, uh, by changing uh, certain incentives that Fiona talked about in uh, in her uh, keynote as well. And I think openness, open scholarship, allows for the realization of a core scientific value that I would say. Well, most every German university student uh, of an empirical discipline uh, uh, is, is usually exposed to in their first year of study, but that curiously uh, doesn't seem to have a straightforward translational counterpart in the English language. And that's the term intersubjektive Nachvollziehbarkeit, which you could loosely translate as intersubjective traceability. That's something I learned about in my first year, uh, year of study. Um, and I find it curious just how much it seems to, to capture the core of what open scholarship is all about. So this core principle of empirical uh, scholarly work has been around for decades, at least in the German school. <laughs> well, I know that. And uh, in the end, it's not, but in the end, it's nothing uh, uh, but, an, uh, but a renewed uh, commitment to, the, uh, to this uh, principle if we embrace uh, open scholarship fully, I think. It's a new, renewed and commitment to this long-standing uh, scientific principle of uh, intersubjective traceability of our work. And this, I think, is also expressed in the perhaps overused but very apropos, I think, open, uh, open scholarship slogan of uh, that open science is just science done right. right? It's nothing dramatically new. 
uh, yet it requires us to change our ways and even sometimes dramatically and that's something that i think should give us pause for thought right just uh, we, we're committing our recommitting ourselves to our own core principles yet it seems to uh, push us into into new directions of uh, doing things so in the end, I think uh, open scholarship, in my view, is not an earth-shattering revolutionary movement uh, of any sort if, uh, with respect to its uh, principal commitments. And I think it indeed has a genuinely, and I think even positive, uh, conservative aspect to it, really. Uh, but the important part, and this is uh, what I like so much about uh, Fiona's keynote, indeed, is that open scholarship, I think, is mostly a movement that endorses our willingness as academics to engage in serious self-reflection uh, in an open-ended way uh, that needs to be inflected and interpreted by each field in, in different context-sensitive ways. Right? Uh, and that's, uh, I think, important to stress, and uh, Mike did this, Fiona did, did this as well, but there's, uh, because there's often an impression of this uh, being some sort of hegemonic, uh, quantitative, uh, positivistic uh, movement, which I think it definitely is not. So in the end, uh, this corresponds to what uh, what uh, Richard Feynman, the Nobel uh, Prize winning uh, physicist, uh, in his uh, 1974 commencement speech uh, at Caltech called a kind of utter honesty, uh, right? embracing a kind of utter honesty as, as researchers uh, and uh, therefore embracing a value which I think drives many junior scholars to begin working on, uh, in, uh, in, in this track of work uh, to begin with, um, but which they often get frustrated with. Uh, uh, because uh, in a published parish cult and publish or parish culture, as uh, Fiona aptly pointed out in a uh, keynote, uh, this very well used often uh, often violated. So this year's theme program, I hope, is only the beginning of uh, of many different conversations we'll be having within all different corners of communication about how that honesty can be maximized and hopefully regained as well. So that's my comment on uh, on the keynote. Thank you so much, uh, Eike. I think also for giving us the the terminology of the unlearning and the relearning, which is a is a very nice way of thinking about that. But but also for making the point of uh, of embracing messiness uh, rather than a, a, a clear cut story uh, in our in our publications. So thanks for that, and uh, then we'll move on to Neil. Thank you. Um, thanks for inviting me to be part of this panel, um, and thanks to Fiona for giving such a wonderful keynote. Um, I agree with pretty much everything she said and find myself nodding along as um, I listen. Um, I'd just like to add and emphasize a few points from my experience with open science for the past few years. Um, and I'll start out by noting that my perspective on open science is shaped by my experiences as a quantitative social scientist uh, who was trained in social psychology during the peak of the replication crisis um, over there. Um, and after I came to communication, um, I've been thinking about how um, the lessons that we learned there might transfer to this field. Um, what lessons can we take from psychology, from medicine, from um, so many people that have been wrestling with these conversations um, and bring here? Um, some things I think are relevant. Um, other things are not. And she also emphasized this um, in her talk. And I think we need to think about these issues in a nuanced way given the much uh, greater breadth of research approaches um, in communication relative to um, those other fields. Um, so the main point that I want to reiterate from uh, Fiona's talk is the importance of really asking ourselves, what is the goal of our research? Um, if we're not clear about what our goals are, it'll be difficult to determine which open research practices are useful for application to the questions that we're working on here in the field of communication. We can end up in a situation where we apply tools um, somewhat mindlessly, uh, which will get us somewhere, but it won't be clear then uh, whether where we end up is where we actually want to go. Um, so that's one thing um, that I think we have to ask ourselves um, individually um, as researchers. It's something we have to ask ourselves collectively as divisions of ICA, and something we have to ask ourselves globally um, as a discipline. Um, what goals are we trying to achieve with our research? Um, achieving different goals may require using different um, open science, um, or open scholarship strategies. My own work uh, focuses heavily on developing interventions to address inequities um, in American society. Um, so I work on advancing theory in order to improve practices that can hopefully reduce um, inequities. Um, that goal is at the foundation of why I care about um, open science and 
why I'm particularly a big fan of practices like pre-registration, um, like open data and open materials. They don't always work uh, perfectly um, for particular studies, uh, but those practices generally, in the way that I do research and for the kinds of questions that I ask, um, those practices generally give us more insights um, into the research processes, the ways that enable us to more efficiently and effectively work together on these larger um, social issues. Um, so these practices really complement the kinds of questions that I ask and the kinds of methods that I use, but um, I know that they're not practices that work well in for other kinds of research. So um, that's something that I want us to think about is what are um, our broader goals? And we have to just be quite explicit about that up front, I think, um, in order to make some of these decisions. So um, that's um, my central way of thinking about um, these open science practices, and I'll stop there. Um, Thanks a lot, Neil. Also, I think for pointing out uh, no, and, and, and asking the question of why uh, we engage in these practices, it's not just for the sake of it. Um, that's a very important, uh, a very important part of, uh, of driving this conversation forward. And also, uh, I think, again, pointing out, which is very true for the communication field and for ICA as an association, uh, the breadth of approaches and the breadth of the types of studies and types of scholarship that we encompass. Um, that also seems like a good point in time to go to Barbie, uh, uh, who uh, is also representing uh, uh, a, a different type of, uh, of, of research than the former social psychologist that we just had on the, on the floor. Barbie. Thank you. Thanks, Klaus, for uh, inviting me. And um, thank you, Fiona, for a wonderfully generative uh, talk. I, I learned a lot. Um, so I, I guess I want to start with what Clay just said, that I, I, you may notice I'm not like the others on this panel. I, I don't typically use the term science to describe my work, which is qualitative, interpretive, humanistic, inductive, and critical, and which I will say is very uneasy with the idea that some of the impulses driving open science matter in the same way to all kinds of researchers. So I guess I'm, I'm here as the punching bag um, to remind us that if my kind of research uh, writ large is to be part of this picture, and I think that, that Fiona did a wonderful job of articulating that as a goal we should aspire to, it needs to, um, to inhabit a slightly more settled place at the table. This is at issue, as Fiona says, because many of the most celebrated aims and practices associated with open science, uh, replication, pre-registration, reuse, redistribution, don't work for much of the qualitative world. Uh, not all qualitative data benefit from transparency. How is one to share interview data, for instance, um, when it violates agreements of confidentiality or anonymity? How is one to use field or ethnographic data when it requires an artificial transcription of the notes that one has taken mainly for oneself. So um, even our focus on open access journals, for instance, I would say, because that's where many of our discussions have been in this field, even that narrows our version of open science to impact factors and numbers of downloads. Um, projects that I would say don't easily gel with all qualitative or interpretive research. So where does that put us as a field that is roughly divided equally between quantitative and qualitative? Fiona offered a very useful cautionary point about not positioning transparency as the end of what we're trying to achieve. We agree that open science strives for the kind of mutual regard, collaboration, acceptive, uh, accountability, transparency, and inclusiveness that ultimately should generate fertile, healthy knowledge growth. But if we stop short of that growth, we end up fetishizing the means we're using to get there, sorry, rather than understanding and accommodating how those means might work differently across the many kinds of research comprising our field. Sorry. This is the dreaded moment in all Zoom sessions. I'm so sorry, I can't get it off. 
I think this is the moment that shows that we are all home working during a global pandemic. And I think we just totally embrace this. Uh, thank you, Bobby, for doing it. <laughs> so I think we need to think more expansively. As Inside Higher Ed recently said, researchers need to demonstrate how they arrive at their conclusions, but they need to do so in terms of their respective traditions in a way appropriate to the particular types of data and methods they've employed. Because of, of course, as we all, I think, are saying, when it comes to research transparency, one size doesn't fit all. Most obviously, this means setting workable measures and metrics for qualitative, inductive, interpretive, humanistic research. But more than the kind of research we do is at stake. We know that the conditions produced by power dynamics and indices of identity, and here I'm thinking the whole gamut of race and gender and sexual orientation and ethnicity and age, as well as employment status, place and career progression. Um, what Mike said about the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, status of one's institution, financial security, how one's culture understands transparency writ large, these all create different conditions for even accommodating and approaching the idea of open science and seeing it into practice. Um, equally important, we don't have mechanisms for situations in which partners don't act with integrity. And specifically here, I'm referring to those who are put at risk when we push for transparency or visibility or accountability. And I'm, I'm thinking specifically of the media practitioners and scholars who are under threat of political intimidation. These are the folks who are at the heart of the Center for Media at Risk, which I direct. They may invest in the idea of open science, or open knowledge sharing, but they have very different degrees of comfort, viability, or sheer autonomy uh, when it comes to its application. Um, so to conclude, yes, we should pursue an investment in open science, but we have to ask if that needs to be for everyone. At a point in time when shared intellectual knowledge is being regularly and systematically undermined by claims to fake science, junk science, taunts to academic authority, of course, we need to be as open and collaborative and mutually supportive as we can be. But with the world beyond the academy set to divide and conquer, we've got to realize that we're all in this together, but not in this together in the same way. This is an opportunity to recognize that not everyone has the interest, the luxury, or the means to embrace open science in the way we might envision. And whatever model we aspire to, has to keep that in mind. Thanks. Thank you, Barbie. Uh, thank you for bringing in that perspective uh, and, and articulating it so well. Uh, I wanted to look uh, at, at Fiona if there were one of the remarks from the uh, opening comments that sparked you to jump in and, and respond uh, immediately. Uh, and if not, then I will pose a first, first more general question. Just uh, unmute, yeah. This is the part where you realize that I'm just waking up. <laughs> um, I think there are lots of, uh, the, well, one issue that I guess that's come up several times is this question of, um, of, who, of who, this is, who these things are relevant for or what kind of disadvantage they might create. So problems about how well resource scholars are and um, about whether we're kind of sidelining certain traditions of research by imposing, for example, regulations around transparency. I think that um, it would, it's a very, it would be a very hard line to run on transparency that, did, that didn't have respect for confidentiality. And that's not actually an argument that I have seen very often within the open science movement. I know that it's a that it's a controversial issue that comes up. It's something, it's a question that people often have. Um, but I I personally don't really see a hard push for across the board transparency coming from within the open science movement. We um, I think most people are aware that there are a lot that there is a tension between openness and confidentiality and privacy. And that that is something that you know we're still working on, and that is that is also going to have very context dependent solutions that will be different for people who who are doing ethnography or qualitative interviews than it will be for people working with large um, data sets. 
Um, I also wanted to acknowledge about, you know, in terms of how we well resourced scholars are, and Neil will be able to speak to this probably better than I am, the rise of things like the psych, um, psych science accelerator and other groups that are responsible for encouraging collaborations and bringing research groups together to overcome some of those issues related to to doing high powered, uh, having high statistical powered studies and issues like that. But I won't talk any longer, I'll wait for discussion questions now. Thanks, uh, Fiona. Um, so I wanted to pick up on a, a line of thinking that you put forward in your, in your, in your keynote um, that you said, well, when we move forward and we want to think of this uh, as something that speaks to different communities and different subfields, uh, we must be very careful that this is not a process of wanting to sideline other fields, but rather to try and think about equivalent mechanisms and equivalent standards. Uh, and I like that way of, uh, of phrasing it because I think it also invites an open conversation of what are what are these equivalencies and what are these mechanisms that could be brought to the fore from different subfields? And I wanted to ask my, my calm colleagues uh, here on the panel, if you agree, is this, if this is a sort of a right terminology and a right way of thinking about this uh, uh, in, in, in order for us to move the conversation uh, forward. Um, who wants to jump in? And this is not an easy question, I realize that, but I, I felt it was a helpful, a helpful uh, terminology and a helpful way to think about uh, the, the moving this conversation forward. Or maybe not. Yeah, can I can I just ask a clarification, sure. please? Are, are you saying that are you are you saying that we should be invested in thinking about the measures that we're using in different parts of the field and articulating them in conversation with each other? Yes, and I was thinking about it because Fiona said, you know, you, what you don't want to do is to import the standards and the, uh, from one field to another field and saying these, these are the standards, so this is the way to think about this. Uh, but I like the, uh, the phrase was to think about sort of equivalent mechanism and the equivalent standards. So what might those be? You yourself pointed to that there are some issues, for example, uh, of pursuing uh, maybe open uh, scholarship when it comes to qualitative interviewing. Um, and I guess my question is, is there a way to, for us to say, okay, take if we then also add uh, um, Ike's utter honesty to the uh, uh, to the equation, what would then be a meaningful way of thinking about qualitative interviewing um, in in this conversation? Uh, I've had the experience of, of as a journal editor uh, trying to encourage the openness and transparency of research instrument, and had a very interesting back and forth with a group of scholars that relied on uh, qualitative interviewing and said we cannot disclose the transcripts, we cannot give that level of detail, but what they did, did uh, do at the end was uh, sharing their research uh, uh, protocols and their sort of interview guides and, and, and disclosing up front that these were things that they had in mind when going in and these were fantastic findings that emerged during the interviews that they had not been thinking about up front uh, but were actually super important obviously as a result and as an outcome of the study and that recreated uh, I think also the, uh, the article and their writing by making that distinction of what was there going in and what emerged in the process. Uh, and I, that's why I like that way of saying, so what are equivalent mechanisms and standards, uh, if that's a helpful terminology for us to use. Now, the posing the, the question became slightly longer than was intended. Yeah, well, so if I, if I could uh, chime in here, um, I, I mean, I think, First of all, I think that the idea of figuring out equivalences in communication is, is a, a, it's a terrific disciplinary project for us, right? I mean, I think we need to kind of, you know, ride on the, on the, on the, on the wings, right, of the fact that we are supposed to be a discipline that brings everybody together in conversation with each other, right? And so articulating what it is one does on each side of the divide to the people on the other is a very useful exercise in, in trying to keep that, that semblance of a common ground. And I will say that something that Ika said, uh, which really rang very true for me about the, the, the nature of unlearning and relearning, I would say that that's what qualitative research does 
all the time. And that's precisely why it is so difficult to find the kind of measure or the kind of explication that you're, that you're talking about. It's the singularity of it, right? It's the, it's the fact that it, it tries very hard um, in most cases, not all cases, but in most cases to be totally different from what came before. And so when, when I could continue to say um, that it, we may end up finding uh, that open research is less flashy, less novel, of less value on its way to being more credible, that is correct. But I'm not sure that I don't, I'm not sure how I see that gelling with the interpretive endeavor in the way that it may with other kinds of research. And that's really where I come up saying, is open science necessarily even relevant to, to qualitative work? I didn't give you your answer. I'm throwing it back, but. I guess the kind of things that I had in mind when I um, made that comment in the talk were things um, that quantitative science could learn from qualitative traditions like making statements of posi positionality or some kind of declaration um, at, the, the, at the start of a paper where you sort of explain your motivation or, potenti or potentially even biases that you have or what kind of philosophical perspective you're coming into this project with. That's something that you, you know, that often is done very well in qualitative research and that does some of the work that we want these other tools in open science to do, right? To give context, to provide more insight, to control for the bias even. Um, and I don't have an extensive list of all of the techniques that qualitative researchers use to do that, but I do know, um, but I do know those few and I, and I don't, I've never, actually really understood why we don't do similar things in quantitative research, why we don't talk about, um, you know, what kind of tradition, what kind of um, philosophical tradition or what, what the typical practices in the lab that we're coming out of or, or whatever it might be, why we don't make those kinds of statements of who we are, why we're doing this, what's our position in this research. I think that resonates very well with Neil's comments about being very explicit about the goals of the research and the motivations uh, for, for undertaking an endeavor. Uh, and in that sense, that seems like a, a, a natural point to, to learn from e each other's traditions in, 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 in approaching that. Um, there yeah. was another, oh, Neil, go ahead. Yeah, just building off of that, um, the thing that I liked um, that Fiona said in, um, a few minutes ago was, the context uh, dependent solutions approach to doing this. I think that can be a way to start um, by figuring this out um, as an ICA community that I, you know, it's, we can look at other fields and see what models are there and think about how they might apply or might not apply. But I don't know that um, there's, it's going to be easy to develop sort of top down um, guidelines for the field. Um, given the breadth of things. Um, and so I wonder if um, one way to move forward on this is to maybe start at division levels. Like, could HealthCom, for instance, come up with um, a way of uh, thinking about open practices within that division? And is that, I mean, I, I don't know if that's a thing, if our research within that division is all similar enough to come up with one set of uh, approaches or not. Um, but that's a useful conversation to have. And maybe then, um, you know, information systems goes through the same exercise. Um, like every division goes through this. And over time, we can start to figure out, well, are there common things that work across divisions? Are there things that, no, it only works for this kind of research, but not um, uh, this other kind of research? Um, yeah, more, the more I think about it, I think maybe that bottom-up uh, approach might help us figure out what are these equivalencies and um, what things are not equivalent. Because to Barbie's point, I, there is a danger of creating false equivalencies um, and then getting sort of trapped within this. Barbie? 
Can I, sorry, can I just follow up? Because I, I, I'm, I, this, yes. Um, what Neil is saying, I think, is actually uber relevant, right? The idea of working from the bottoms up, but I would not work from the bottoms up across divisions and interest groups, because of course, we know that each of the divisions and interest groups, particularly in ICA, are a wonderful mix, right, of different kinds of methodologies. So maybe this is a moment to use the opportunity of thinking about open science as a way to be thinking about method, right? And to be thinking about method, what is it? Because as, as Fiona says, yes, of course, positionality, of course, articulating one's context, of course, articulating um, one's limitations, right? Um, the, 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 the natural contours that tend to get elided over unless we point to them and say, wait a second, this is my, what I'm saying is good till this point and not relevant beyond that point. If we can do that, right, and think about what constitutes openness, then I think we have a far better chance of, of doing it. So maybe this is, this is an invitation to the, to the discipline to really start talking about the methods that we use and the unevenness of the methods as they're being implicated. So let me jump right on that uh, because it almost begs uh, beg another question I had in relation to Fiona's talk. You, you mentioned and I also described that, that a research culture uh, in a field must be ready for these conversations. So here's the question, are we in the comp field ready to do this? Because I like the, the bottom up, I like the, uh, and, and not doing it, both learning from the uh, conversations in interest groups and divisions, but also making sure we don't silo within those, and, but look more holistically and methods are, it's a good way to, to, uh, to start. But um, dear comp scholars, colleagues in the field, are we ready to have these conversations? Well, I would yeah. say, of course. Oh, oh sorry, Mike. Uh, well, I would, I would, I would say, of course. Yeah, uh, we better be ready, <laughs> because it's, uh, it's, it's a conversation that's uh, I, that I think should be built into uh, into the, uh, the kind of work we do. Right? We we should always be be uh, looking at uh, just how open in, in the different meanings of the term uh, we actually are in the way we operate. Right? And uh, I absolutely uh, agree with what Barbie said about uh, this uh, this being required to be uh, to be a bottom up uh, sort of really really context uh, sensitive uh, um, thing to happen. So we're actually rethinking our, uh, the way we formulated our, our call for papers for for ICA, I think we talked about a single conversation uh, that we'd like to have. I think it's actually got, uh, it, it'll need to be uh, conversations uh, uh, that need to be had. Um, within the uh, within the association, um, so yeah, no, absolutely, we 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 should be we should be ready. If we are not, I think uh, then if, at least my view we, we will have failed in some way uh, as researchers if, if we think well we we're not ready to have that conversation. Um, curious to hear what others uh, others think about this as well. Mike, yeah, you wanted to jump in. Sure. Yeah. Th thanks. Um, uh, yeah, I uh, would second the. Maybe even go further and say I think that you know the discipline is largely ready for the conversation, and I think I would just build upon what what I said and agree and say yeah, it's not one right it's conversations and it's it's these bottom up conversations uh, that we were discussing or you all were discussing a moment ago that I was nodding with a moment ago, and then it's you know it's probably more things like this where there are broad conversations at, at orienting moments when under normal circumstances, we would all gather together <laughs> and have conversations with each other. Um, but it's something I think that we, we'll, we'll need to continue. I, I know when the, like when the no sick psychology replication stuff first hit, we discussed that at, at faculty meetings and saying, you know, we need to be ready for this. We need to be thinking about this and, and having conversations, you know, across the different kinds of subfields of the discipline. But I, I, I really appreciate uh, the point Barbie was making about method. I think that it's crucial to kind of interact method and subfield to see, is there agreement between experimentalists and health comm versus Polcom, for example, about the limits and, uh, you know, uh, of, of, of pre-registration and the benefits of pre-registration and that sort of thing. And, and then, but I think starting with method from the bottom up is, is, a, is a great place to seed some of these conversations.
can I, can I jump in yes, again? Yes. I, 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 I think you, I totally agree. I, I'm reminded of an exercise that we did at the Annenberg School over the past couple of years. We've always had a, um, a research methods introductory course, but the research methods introductory course was by and large taught by primarily quantitative researchers who would either invite one of the qualitative folks in as a, as a kind of, you know, on spot, here's what I do, or, or speak to qualitative um, uh, methods on, on their own. And largely, um, it, was, it was an exercise of inertia that just kept, it didn't want to happen. And then finally, it was Kathleen Hall Jamison and it was Jessa Lingle, um, who basically kind of just drove the conversation. And we, we made up a, a new qualitative methods uh, 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 course that we are now requiring of students together with the more quantitative research methods. And the interesting point I want to make about that is that qualitative researchers by and large are not real comfortable talking about method, not in the way that quantitative researchers tend to do. It's not typically, I mean, we, we just, we don't make it as explicit, I think, as other kinds of researchers. And yet it should be far more explicit than it is. And it, it, the fact that it took us so long to kind of get to a point where we could say, okay, these are the readings we, we agree on. These are the kinds of qualitative methods that we agree on, right? Because you, it's very hard to sample in a small universe from that. Um, suggests that this could be a really, a wonderful moment of generative thinking for us as a field, as connected to open science, which is something that by and large, I mean, just given how much we are um, entrenched within technology, right? It's, it's odd that we haven't been leading up until now. And so there's a, there's a real research moment here, I think that we could build upon. It's almost as if you just gave me the cue on technology for another topic that I wanted to make sure is also part of our opening plenary. And that is saying that not only are we, uh, you know, broad in terms of the substantive fields that we look at and broad in terms of our methods, but we are also a discipline that is highly engaged with all kind of new, be it big data, computational, or human machine interaction, or artificial intelligence. And that is just adding, I would say, an additional layer of complexity to the now plural conversations uh, that, that we will be having, uh, and, and, but, but also one where I believe that we as a field must be very central to that conversation because we are driving a lot of the research in these areas. And this is uh, adding a layer of complexity because we have, uh, we're dealing with other types of data. We're de dealing with other types of studies. We're dealing with issues of accessibility of data where the replicability uh, of previous studies uh, is really posing at just an additional layer. So. Uh, my own take on, on that is that, that, that we as a discipline might be more challenged than some of the more confined social science disciplines that have had this conversation a little earlier, but that we uh, might also bring even uh, uh, more to the table if we can come up the other end with some both practical uh, and workable uh, solutions. Um, but I was curious uh, also on, on uh, with you as panelists, uh, how you see the, say the computational, big data, uh, uh, AI, parts of our community, uh, because if Barbie says in the beginning, oh, I feel challenged and I wanna ask the question, can we just import these practices and is it, how, how necessary is it and how do we do it? I would say that that part of our discipline uh, has to have that same conversation. Neil, your your thinking. That's a good. Uh, I I want to hear your thoughts. <laughs> well, well, I can only uh, sort of add to this uh, that I uh, absolutely agree that it's uh, it, it will I think be a boon to uh, to our field having these conversations. That I think as a field, maybe not even the discipline, uh, uh, we we are so multifaceted and ecumenical uh, compared to many other disciplines uh, that I would hope at least uh, this uh, set of the conversations to be more, uh, more integrated, more tolerant also towards different points of view uh, than, uh, than it has been in some other disciplines. I know just by point of comparison, for example, that in political science, which 
at least in the Anglo-Saxon uh, inflection, is uh, I think a little bit more dominated uh, yet than uh, than communication by uh, by positivist uh, uh, quantitative approaches to doing research. It, it's been really hard, I think, for uh, for humanistic interpretivist uh, approaches to to uh, find their voice uh, there to uh, to not feel like this is some uh, sort of hegemonic. Uh, uh, encroachment uh, that's happening uh, and that's marginalizing them, you know, them even further. Uh, I think there's uh, a lot of a uh, lot of insight to learn for us uh, from from this experience. But I also think that our chances, hopefully, are better uh, in, in not getting into a situation where uh, where we are uh, sort of having a, a discourse of open science that's seen as uh, as uh, colonial in some sense. Uh, just to the to the big data point uh, and the computational uh, point Clace was making, I think th there's a lot of work to do, I think, with respect to the openness with which scholars engage in that kind of work from, from a variety of vantage points, one of which is a lot of the uh, tools we use have kind of back ends that are a mystery, even to sometimes the scholars who are using them. And so you, 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 you code your, your 500, 5,000 tweets by hand, feed them into the proprietary system you've purchased from somewhere else, and then you get some sort of result. We have some, we, we need to be worried about backends that we can't see and, and control. And in order to solve that problem, we need to develop interdisciplinary skills in computer science and statistics and other sorts of things, which probably requires interdisciplinary collaboration and a whole host of other new behaviors um, that we, we need to really be taking seriously, I think, as uh, we start to follow these, these lines of work, especially as, uh, like, with, with what's happening now with the pandemic. So, you know, you, like, uh, Twitter will make uh, endpoint access available to some scholars for some period of time to help deal with and uh, research questions of, say, misinformation. Um, so how do we unpack that kind of research versus those who were typically sampling from a, the 1% you know, sample of Twitter or something like that, just as an example of all the different things we need to think about managing um, with these newer um, and exciting uh, areas of inquiry. Yeah, so between the, uh, the interview data and the uh, machine learning, there's a lot to be resolved here, that's, uh, that's for sure. Um, I'm mindful of the, uh, of the time here. Um, we, it, it, it's hard to watch Zooms endlessly, and though we've tried to uh, introduce the notion of binging the ICA conference, uh, I want to, uh, us to come to a, an end here, and that would be the typical point at which I would go to the audience and say, you know, let's get some questions from the room, and we will get that at the end. But I wanted to maybe sort of invite Fiona towards the end here, having heard this conversation, uh, we were very cognizant of wanting to have a speaker to come from the outside of the field uh, and come in and give us a, us a perspective. Um, having heard this conversation on this panel, what are the types of advice or observations that you make and, and, and thoughts that you might uh, give us uh, when we move our plural conversations forward? Uh, I think one thing I think is really interesting, um, this isn't advice necessarily, but that, that both of these things when you're talking about kind of the machine learning, big data stuff that we've been talking about towards the end and the qualitative traditions, what they have in common, I think, is that they don't fit within that hypothetical, deductive, idealised method, you know, that I showed in my slide with the blue circle. And in fact, I think, um, you know, what historians of science would tell us is that probably not a whole lot of the science that we do do does fit within that circle. I mean, nobody, nobody knows, but like, what if it's only 10% or 20%? And at the moment we're treating everything or trying to squash everything we can into, so that it looks like that method, so that we can get it published, so that it gets the kind of, has the impact that we wanted to have or gets the press coverage. Um, and that's got problem, you know, that's, that's largely responsible for a lot of the problems that we see in replication and, and other and misuse of statistics and a whole range of things. But the, the other consequence of it is that it does, um, for disciplines that, that can't quite squeeze them into themselves or, re, or have rejected squeezing themselves into that circle, like qualitative methods, they, um, 
they don't often don't get the the kind of recognition and legitimacy that they should and we end up in a situation where perhaps 80 percent of the work we're doing is in fact exploratory work of some kind or other whether that's qualitative um, work or exploratory modeling or big data stuff and we're not we're not acknowledging that so we've got all of these fixes now that are designed um, all of you uh, well a majority of the tools and fixes that we have in open science are designed to address only this 10 20 percent or whatever the number is of research that fits um, a hypothetical deductive model and we really need to start thinking differently about science and stop talking about science or research as having a method. This idea of a monolithic uh, scientific method is at the heart of a lot of our problems. I'll stop. I think you have also <laughs> just identified unknowingly probably exactly the challenge that we have as a communication field because we span that entire spectrum from uh, uh, from all of the different vantage points that, that we've discussed in, the, in this panel. Um, I want to, as a, a planner of the 2020 conference, committing to saying that I hope ICA uh, will be a place where we can have these conversations in the plural uh, and that we will engage in them with a real open mind. I think this call for the uh, utter honesty uh, is also part of what will shape our conversations and what will hopefully also bring us forward collectively as we see some of these conversations come up from the divisions. This is obviously also for me a moment to plug for everybody viewing uh, to go to uh, ICA's uh, program uh, on open communication throughout the conference where actually some of these things are also unpacked a little more. We have a session that looks at qualitative research uh, more in depth. We have one that actually looks at computational uh, approaches and open uh, scholarship more in depth. So please uh, search that program and I hope that this opening plenary has been an inspiration for driving forward the uh, conversations going forward. I want to thank all of you on the panel and especially you Fiona for bringing your perspective to us as a field and to the 70th International Communication Association Conference. Thank you so much. <laughs>